We're now going to hand this over to Dr. Jessica Barker, based out of the UK. I have been dying to get us over here to us at a global audience, so I'm very excited to have her. Jessica, the floor is virtually yours. Thank you so much, Lance. I am just as excited, if not more excited than you, to be here. It's a real pleasure to be speaking with you all, and I'm so honored to be able to, to share with this presentation with you all today. So today I'm talking about what 2020 can teach us about cybersecurity awareness, behavior, and culture. And I am going to try to move along the uh, slide deck we're having. Yes, I did it. I did it too fast. You see, I'm so enthusiastic. I can't get going. And then when I get going, I go too fast. So what 2020 teaches us about cybersecurity, awareness, behavior, and culture is what I'm focusing on. Because I think we can all agree it's been quite a year. And um, there's always things that I think we can take from other experiences, other disciplines, research in other areas to apply to actually what we're all doing in cybersecurity, awareness, behavior, and cultural change. So that's what I'm talking about um, today. Why am I talking about this stuff? Well, I've been working in cybersecurity for about 10 years and have always been lucky enough to focus on awareness, behavior, and culture. Like all of you, I'm sure, I absolutely love what I get to do to be able to learn so much about this industry and share that learning with people. I really love being able to do that as part of my job as co-CEO of Sygenta, the company I run with my husband, um, with a team here in the UK, but working globally. I'm also the chair of Club CISO, so that means um, an industry body. We've got about 400 CISO or senior information security leaders who are part of that community, getting together, sharing their information, sharing what's happening to them, their challenges and their successes. And I'm gonna share some data um, from research that we've conducted in Club CISO later on. And I've written a couple of books uh, about cybersecurity, um, one which was published in September and one which I've co-authored and that's coming out in January. So I love cybersecurity, awareness, behavior and culture and I love any chance to talk about it, especially with this community who I really love um, and get so much inspiration from. So as I said, it's quite a year, 2020. Um, we've had a lot going on. We've had a lot to deal with and a lot that I think we didn't see coming. And in terms of cybersecurity awareness and behavior, the fact that we are going through this pandemic presents certain challenges, of course, that we need to consider and also thinking about our tone and how we communicate um, with people and the fact that there is, of course, a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry and concern out there uh, for many of us when it comes to COVID-19. And so when we're also communicating about a threat and we're communicating about something where we want behavioral change, then actually the fact that there's this context of COVID-19 means we need to keep that in mind and think about our communications and how we manage them. And of course, it's had this, it's had this individual impact, you know, where a lot of us are anxious and there's quite a lot of fear, uncertainty and doubt in general in communities around the world because of COVID-19. It has also, of course, had this organizational impact. And I'm sure many of us saw this meme uh, doing the rounds over the last few months, because it's, it's just true, isn't it? I think for many organizations, they have been through this forced digital transformation this year. And plans that were in place to take the organization on a journey of digital transformation, maybe over the space of months or even years, those plans for many places had to be accelerated. And we saw organizations actually taking action over the space of days or at the most weeks that they were planning for you know, a time frame of months or years. So COVID-19 had, of course, that really big impact um, on many companies and how we were working and how we were managing to continue to work and operate. And from a cybersecurity point of view, I'm not going to spend a long time at all talking about the threat, um, but it has had this big impact on the threat landscape. 
So for example, research from Kroll that's been uh, fairly recently released, which shows that ransomware would be topping um, the threats that they have seen this year. And about a quarter of that ransomware spread by phishing emails and social engineering. So that really human element to it. We have seen ransomware be a really big problem. I feel like every year since maybe 2016, maybe 2017, it's been said around this time of year, oh, this was the year of ransomware. And again, we're saying it this year because ransomware just keeps on growing, unfortunately. And this year we have seen that um, real human impact of ransomware as well, where we have unfortunately had the first deaths that have been attributed cyber, to a cyber attack um, connected to ransomware that's been hitting hospitals. So suddenly it really puts everything into perspective when we're talking about dealing with a pandemic and ransomware that then is actually having that impact on human loss of life. Of course, as I'm sure many of us have experienced at a personal and organizational level, COVID-19 has proven to be the biggest theme that I believe we have ever seen on a global scale applied to phishing emails. And it's because it does provide this perfect storm for cyber criminals that they can take advantage of. Many of us are anxious, we are worried, our stress levels are higher than normal, we want more information. And there is this evolving unseen threat that where new information is, is coming out very often and we want to keep pace with it. And so cyber criminals, of course, are exploiting those facts because the more anxious somebody is, the more busy somebody is, the more somebody wants information, the more susceptible they are to social engineering. And this is why we have seen this huge spike in social engineering, particularly using the COVID-19 virus. And lots of other news about cybersecurity and incidents. So, of course, as different nations are trying to race to find out more information about the virus, about what we can do to develop vaccines, there are allegations that there has been increased state on state activity, particularly targeted at this kind of research. So there's a lot going on, right? There's a lot going on in terms of cybersecurity and in terms of the human side, what we need to communicate to people, the fact that we need to make them aware of this stuff and try to positively influence their behaviors and the culture of our organizations. And it has that impact on how we do it. But what I really want to focus on is actually looking at the communications around COVID-19 and what we can learn from those communications, parallels that we can identify and apply to cybersecurity. Because we've, we've known for a long time that there are these similarities between um, public health and health communications and cybersecurity and security communications. As I said before, an unseen and evolving threat we could talk about that in terms of the pandemic and we could talk about that in terms of cybersecurity. What we're looking to do when it comes to COVID-19 and other health initiatives is often change everyday small behaviors that can then have this bigger impact. Again, that sounds very much like, like cybersecurity. We're trying to influence those everyday behaviors. We're trying to raise awareness of something that people can't see, but that is very real. And we're trying to have that impact on small behaviors to have that bigger impact overall. So I wanted to look at some of the communications and to take some lessons learned. And the first thing that sprung to mind when I thought about this was communications that came out from um, the UK government. And we saw at the start of the UK lockdown, we had this messaging that you can see with the red, stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. So we had these very clear cons that came out um, and is using that red color. 
Um, yesterday, there was a great presentation by Lisa and Perry talking about um, color and the fact that we should be thinking about the colors we use in cybersecurity. And it was, it was really interesting um, to hear their conversation around that. And I totally agree um, that we need to think about colors when it comes to comms. And that's why I was fascinated to see this because the UK government started with this messaging that was very clear and it used the red. And red globally around the world is associated with many things, but one of the core things would be danger. We have red, amber, green in most countries. And so it was really interesting to see them have this messaging, which starts off very clear and uses that red, that sort of subconscious signal. And then a few months later, uh, they changed it from stay home to stay alert, uh, from protect the NHS to control the virus, and then they kept the save lives. But they also changed the color. And I was really interested as to why they may be changed from red to green, because I think for many of us, again, if we're using that red, amber, green, green means go. Green is usually reassuring. It means everything's okay, you're good to go. So I think there's, there's messages, then there's lessons we can take from this alone is thinking about how we present and how we change maybe any communications that we have. Because research suggests that the vast majority of people in the UK with that first messaging, it's stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. I think it was over 90% of people who said that they were very clear on what the government wanted them to do. I think it was 91%. Um, and they felt like they really understood that messaging and they felt very comfortable with it. And then when we got to this changed messaging, stay alert, focus groups with individuals found that the majority actually didn't know what that meant. How, how do we stay alert with COVID-19? People were confused. And research also suggests that there was less engagement with the behaviors that um, we actually wanted people to pursue. So we found that actually with that green stay alert messaging, um, research suggests that more people started flouting the rules. And in fact, in some age groups, there was double the amount of people flouting the rules when confronted with this messaging compared to the previous one. So I think we can see what the issue is there, really. We, yeah, we've got the red and the green, but it's so imprecise. It goes from stay home, clear messaging of what I should do, my behavior, to stay alert, which isn't a behavior, it's kind of a state of mind. <laughs> um, and it's, it's hard for somebody to do, and it's very hard to maintain. I can't stay alert all of the time. And so I decided to delve into this a little bit deeper and I found a really interesting report by uh, the Independent SAGE group. So the Independent SAGE group is a group of independent scientists who have come together um, to look at what is happening around COVID-19 uh, in the UK. And they did a really interesting report just published a couple of weeks ago where they actually do a really thorough analysis of communications around COVID-19. And one of the key messages that stood out of what they're saying is that, of course, precise messaging is more readily understood. And that means when people understand the messaging, they're more likely to adhere to it and perform that consistent behavioral action that you want. Whereas if messaging is imprecise, if it's inconsistent, if it contradicts um, other messaging that you maybe heard elsewhere or messaging that you were sharing earlier, if it comes at the wrong time or if it's vague, then that can lead to mistakes. It can make people think that it's unfair what you're asking them to do or the messaging you're sharing. It can frustrate people and ultimately not lead to the behaviors that you want. And I read that quote and I really thought that that can often sum up security awareness. Because let's be honest, it's, it's not easy to share some of this messaging. You know, it can be difficult to really get to the heart of it and to think, what precisely do we want to say here? What, what is the absolute behavior that we want to communicate? And how can we be consistent with that? How do we tackle the fact that actually sometimes the messaging in the security community is not consistent and contradicts one another. So messaging that comes from one place might, on passwords, for example, might be different to messaging that comes from elsewhere. You may have some people saying it's great to use a password manager and other people saying, 
Oh, it's a bit risky to use a password manager. It's great to use two-factor authentication. Oh, SMS two-factor authentication, that can be a bit risky. So sometimes we have this problem where our messaging is hard to keep it consistent and not contradicting. So we have to realize that that's an issue we have to tackle. And sometimes we just have to be upfront about why it is to help people understand. So that quote for me really stood out as something that we can take a lesson from and consider when we're designing our awareness. And so I went through the rest of the report and I thought, what else, you know, what else applies? What else can we learn from what's happening with COVID-19 and this messaging that is so fundamental? What can we take to our messaging in cybersecurity? And one key message that they make in this report is that there is no point trying to enforce a strategy if people are not ready to adopt it. So we can't ask people to do something if it's not possible. And I thought that sounds, that sounds very familiar to me. Exhibit A, what is that? I come across this very often um, when organizations will have a password policy and they will be asking people to do certain things with their passwords, a certain length, a certain complexity, maybe even still, despite the fact that it contradicts official guidance from UK and US governments, for example, still asking people to regularly change their passwords. So asking people to do an awful lot to manage their passwords, but giving people no way to manage it, not having a password manager or not having single sign on. And so when I am um, communicating with an organization like that and I will ask the CISO, well, how, how are people, how are you expecting people to do this? Why isn't there a password manager? Why isn't there single sign on? And they'll say, oh yeah, we want to do that. We're trying to get there, but we're just, it's, it's too difficult at the moment. It's too challenging. We're not able to do that yet it's too complex. And I thought, well, it's very difficult and it's very challenging and it's very complex to ask people to remember random, strong, unique passwords, different for all of their accounts. It's not possible. So when it comes to awareness, my rule is that I only want to raise awareness of something if people can actually follow through with the behavior. And if it's asking too much of them, then I can't do that. I can't put that on them as the person that has to then follow through with it. And I turned to Boseron. So I've been doing some um, work with Boseron. We collaborate with them um, on an organization level. And I've been helping them with some surveys that they've been um, running with their clients. And so turned to them to ask them for some of their latest data. I wanted to know actually how are people managing their passwords? What's the current state of play? And so they recently did a survey with 30,000 people and asked, how do you manage your passwords? And found that the vast majority are still either remembering them, you know, overwhelming majority still saying that they just remember them. Well, we know if people just remember their passwords, it's highly unlikely that those passwords are gonna be strong enough and are gonna be unique. Um, so it, it's just not reliable. Um, other people, you know, after that, second most popular, I use a pattern only I know. Maybe some of that, what, almost 9,000 people do have their own unique pattern. But what I find is the majority of people are using a pattern that lots of other people are using as well. At Sygenta, we do a lot of password cracking. And I was just earlier today um, interrogating a database of um, 1 billion breached passwords. And of course, everybody's using the same pattern and cyber criminals know this and that goes into their password cracking dictionaries. And we can see then the much smaller numbers are people using a password manager, people writing them down. So actually, the behavior that we want is the least likely behavior. And I think that's partly because we're just not giving people the tools in our organizations to manage their passwords. And in their personal lives, I think we're not making it easy enough for them to understand how they can manage their passwords more securely. Another quote that really stood out for me in terms of this report was positive messaging enables people to do more things safely. That's what we should be focusing on. And this really spoke to my heart because it's something that I have been trying to champion for years is that we need to make sure our awareness raising 
is more positive because people really don't engage with negative messaging in the same way. And that can be a challenge when it comes to security. But I know so many people in the community will be nodding along and agreeing with me that positive messaging is just so much more effective, particularly when we're at a point where there is a lot of stress and anxiety and uncertainty and fear about COVID-19. The last thing we want to be doing in the security community is adding to stress and anxiety and uncertainty and fear about cybersecurity. So how we can use more positive messaging because that enables people to do things more safely. And something we can sometimes make that mistake with is telling people, you know, don't click malicious links. Of course, we don't want people to click malicious links. Um, but the problem with that messaging is that it is asking people to sort of do a negative, you know, don't click a malicious link. Or for one thing, how do they identify the links are malicious? People aren't usually purposely clicking on the malicious links. It's not that they want to, um, it's that they are tricked into doing so. So I find that, of course, we need to raise awareness of the importance of being careful with emails. But more important than that, I think our awareness raising needs to focus on how you report a suspected fish. And I have seen a big change in organizations in this over the last year alone, actually, who have moved from focusing very much on click rate to focusing much more on reporting rate. And that is awesome. It is absolutely the kind of approach I think we need to take. So at Sygenta, we led um, as part of a volunteer group, the Cyber Volunteers 19 group, CV19, um, which was formed in the UK by some cybersecurity professionals. It was formed to um, really help healthcare organizations provide pro bono support and resources that they could use in terms of their cybersecurity while they were dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. So at Sygenta, we were asked to lead on the awareness raising and absolutely delighted to accept. Um, so as a team, we worked on this and Madeline, who is giving a lightning talk shortly, uh, she worked really closely um, on this with me for us to think about the messaging we wanted to put out in terms of hospitals, in terms of healthcare organizations, to help them have a bit more awareness of cybersecurity while they were so busy and stretched and being so amazing responding to the, to the COVID-19 pandemic. So the first campaign we focused on was around phishing and we wanted to embrace that positive messaging. So we really wanted it to be empowering. We didn't wanna be telling people, um, you know, lots of negative stuff, but of course we wanted to bring the threat to life. We wanted to, to make sure people understand the threat is real. Um, so we thought about how to do this and what we wanted to do was use empowering messaging like, you know, like everything else, you've got this covered and it's not wrong to check it's right. We really wanted it to be action orientated and to help people understand that actually sometimes they just need to take that minute to think and there's nothing wrong with that. And we wanted to use the emoji just to, again, add that bit of emotion and kind of show this um, scenario and this narrative with the different posters um, in terms of a phishing scam. And we had great feedback on it. Uh, one thing we really wanted to avoid was telling people stuff that they already knew. When it comes to phishing, actually, there's a high level of awareness out there. There's a lot of training focused on it. Um, so it's more about giving people that reminder and showing them how scams can escalate. So that's what we really focused on for the phishing campaign. And then I wanna share with you a video that we made around physical security, where again, we tried to focus on being more positive because we knew that healthcare workers were already dealing with um, enough negativity. We didn't wanna add more of that emotional stress. So what we wanted to focus on there were key messages that we came up with in consultation with healthcare workers. We had been contacted by a few different hospitals who were telling us that they were having physical security incidents. So resources uh, were being stolen, toilet roll, hand sanitizer, um, PPE, 
was being stolen. Um, and there was issues, you know, in terms of um, ID badges being stolen for people to presumably take advantage of some of the kind um, discounts that were available to healthcare workers. Um, and always they, they reported to us, of course, this issue of um, devices being left open because healthcare workers are so busy, right? Um, so we wanted to create this campaign that spoke to those messages that gave the action orientation that explained as succinctly as possible the why, but that still had that kind of positive and empowering message. I hope people could hear the sound on that. I couldn't hear the sound. I've got a video coming up where you're going to want to hear the sound. Um, so if you couldn't hear it on that, I hope you hear it on the next one. Um, and this is something that ties in to the positivity. Um, which is that if we use messages that talk about bad practice and what not to do, then that can actually backfire. And this ties into social proof, um, whereby if we always tell people, don't do this, don't do that, um, then it actually can convey other people are doing this and other people are doing that. So it can backfire on us. And in one way that I find every year that this can backfire is when the worst password lists of the year are published. And I totally get why we do this and why we talk about that. But I think we sort of need to think about the language of how we communicate a message like that. Because if we say everyone's using a terrible password, we may think that we are shocking people into the fact that loads of people are using terrible passwords. But according to principles of social proof, actually, if we say everyone's using a terrible password, what we can be communicating to some people is, don't worry, everyone else is using a terrible password. It's fine for you to do the same. If we keep saying the majority of people aren't engaging in behaviors that we want, then actually it doesn't add that social proof behind us. It doesn't show the behavior that we want. It shows the behavior that we don't want. And this is something that got some attention in the UK. Um, so for people abroad, I don't know if you will have seen this, um, but this was some messaging that the government came out with um, where they used the slogan, hands, face, space for COVID-19. And this was something the report picked up on. Um, they found that, of course, unless you understand what they mean by hands, face, space, um, then you don't know what your action is. You don't know what you're meant to do. And so the report actually said that they held focus groups and they showed this slogan to people and they asked them, what do you think about this? And some people actually came back saying they thought that face meant wash their face. Understandable, because especially if you don't have any kind of imagery with it, hands face space on its own, what does that actually mean? And so what really struck me about this one, to be honest, is a lot of stuff that we can communicate. Use a secure password. What does secure mean? What's a secure password? Use two-factor authentication, use a VPN, all of these kind of behaviors that we can try to promote, unless people know what it means, then actually those words become meaningless. And I'm about to play a video, so I hope we're gonna get the audio on it. If not, we're gonna be sharing it more widely, so you'll find it on social media. Um, but we've had this in mind for a while, and it was particularly when we saw that kind of messaging that we thought, this really applies to cybersecurity. So we did a fun little video to try and bring that to home. Look for the little green padlock. This padlock tells you that the site is secure, but remember secure doesn't mean safe, it just means that if a criminal is running the site, you can be sure that only the criminal running the site can see your traffic, not other criminals. Never join Wi-Fi unless your computer doesn't have a cable, then join Wi-Fi, but don't join bad Wi-Fi, only good Wi-Fi. You won't be able to tell which is which, but that's fine, just avoid the bad Wi-Fi. If you connect to Wi-Fi, which you shouldn't, apart from when you should, use a VPN, but make sure there's a good VPN, not a bad one. Make sure you stick to these rules to be securely connected. Absolutely, do not click links unless you need to click links, but be sure you understand the complex and impossible to see Unicode style attacks. Whatever you do, never download anything ever except for those things you need to download, like patches or password managers and VPNs. Just don't download the bad stuff. 
apart from the stuff of course you need to download for like work or the stuff you want to download like for fun but other than the stuff you need to download or want to download don't download anything especially don't download anything malicious easy right just remember cyber hands cyber face cyber, cyber space. space so we really couldn't resist that one and it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because we're in this position where we do have complicated messaging to communicate. And we're often trying to take stuff that's really complex and is sometimes a bit contradictory, or maybe the guidance has changed from what it was a few years ago. And we're trying to take it all and funnel it into something that is comprehensible, that is clear, that is succinct, and that helps people understand what we're trying to communicate and behave in the way that we want. So it's not easy. And I don't also just want to point out the bad stuff around the COVID-19 communications. I think there are some good stuff that we can learn from as well, and that really applies to our field. I read a really interesting blog post. And if you haven't already read this, I would highly recommend you to take a look, not just at this one, actually, but other resources that have been shared by the Government of Canada and the Canadian Digital Service around how they've been doing some of the communications with COVID-19. This was a particularly great blog post where they explain how they designed the content for their COVID alert app. And this quote, again, really stood out to me. One of the keys to success was trust. They knew that they had to get citizens to trust in the app if they were going to use it. And the key to trust is understanding. If people don't understand what they're doing, what you're trying to say, then of course they're not going to trust in it. And a fantastic point they made was around detail and the fact that they were trying to communicate something detailed and complex and it would have been easy for them to get caught up in what they want to communicate, the messages that they think are relevant. But instead they focused on actually what is relevant for the people who will be using this app? Not what do I want to communicate, but what are they gonna hear? What's gonna resonate with them? How can we simplify this for them? And again, I was really pleased to see this quote, every time you add detail, you make it harder for people to extract what's relevant for them. And they used this example of a subway map. And they said, if you think about a subway map that is trying to get people from A to B, you won't see what's above ground. You won't see all of the kind of geographical context. You will just see subway maps as much as possible stripped back to the information that you need to see as a traveler. You might even only see one section of the map of where you are currently rather than the whole big picture. And they said that's what they really tried to focus on when it came to the app. And this to me seemed so relevant. I have been working with a client today doing awareness raising and they're, they're a great client, so enthusiastic about raising awareness in their organization and about making sure they get as much information to people as possible. They haven't done awareness raising really like this before. And so there was lots of information that we wanted to share with people and we were excited about it. But what we have been working on in the lead up to the sessions is how can we strip this back as much as possible? How can we make sure that we are giving people just enough detail that they need rather than overwhelming them because we want to tell them everything? And so one thing was taking, for example, one slide with a few bits of information on and stripping that down into five or six. If you're thinking about your comms campaign over the year, you might be thinking about doing, you know, one big campaign. Instead, how can you break it up and make it more bite size so that you make it less work for people to digest what you're trying to communicate? And they spoke about language in this blog post and they said, for example, they thought about using the word anonymous to convey how data was being used. But they realized, what does anonymous actually mean when it comes to technology? You know, the dictionary definition of anonymous is that it won't include your name. But an anonymity, when it comes to technology, is so much more complicated than that. And they wanted people to really trust what they were doing. 
So they give this great analysis of how they broke down really what they meant by anonymous. And they, instead of just using that one word and expecting people to understand it, they laid it out for people. They said, the app doesn't use GPS. We have no way of knowing your address, your name, your location, and we only know about your health, what you choose to share. So absolutely fantastic way of thinking, not from the point of view of what they wanna communicate, but from the point of view of how it is received. And this is a screenshot from um, when you join the app. And I thought it was great the way that they focus so much on community. They wanted to take this away from being just about the individuals and instead to help people understand that this is about not just taking care of yourself, but protecting the community. So they really use this empowering message. And I also think it's worth noting that they use an image that encourages um, an appreciation of diversity and inclusion. They use this image that actually shows all sorts of different people because they didn't want to just limit who people, you know, who people thought this was applicable to and whether it was applicable to them. And I thought about this in terms of the COVID-19 comms, and I thought about this in terms of cybersecurity and the fact that often we can communicate our messaging very much at the individual level and about individual behaviours. So I started having a look in terms of COVID-19 and culture and again found this really interesting paper that brings out some parallels between COVID-19 comms and cybersecurity. And it highlights the fact again, only published a few months ago, of course, highlights the fact that in the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of comms have focused on individual risk. And the authors argue that actually, of course, we must be thinking more about culture and about community and about the fact that the risk for COVID-19 can be heightened depending on existing inequalities. So they talk about actually how to be more community engaged and how to reduce collective risks. And I think this is so applicable to us, for us as a community be, to be thinking about what do our comms mean when it comes to culture and how can we be thinking more about collective risk and addressing issues of inequality, diversity and inclusion. I am a big believer that culture is hugely important when it comes to cybersecurity and thinking about how we can work on building a more positive cybersecurity culture. And I mean this in, in two kinds of ways. One way, how we can influence more positive cybersecurity cultures in our organizations, but also how we can think about a more positive culture for cybersecurity in general as an industry and as a community. And that's why I love, one of the reasons I love the SANS um, security awareness community, because there is such a positive culture here. And I think that's fantastic and something we can build on in the wider security community. Um, people often wonder kind of what is culture when it comes to cybersecurity. So I wanted to share um, an example and some learning from that space that might be helpful for anyone who is just kind of starting to think about cybersecurity culture. There's a great definition um, when it comes to organizational culture by Edgar Schein, who is a very well-established um, professor of MIT in organizational culture. And he has done a great deal in his career to um, explore organizational culture, which he describes as the values and the beliefs that establish the norms of expected behavior that employees then might follow. So it is not the behavior, it's what's lying beneath the behavior that makes us think that it's normal to behave like that. And he has a model of organizational culture that's usually represented as a triangle. And I have decided to represent it today in terms of an iceberg, because I think that um, illustrates it quite well. So Edgar Schein talks about different um, sort of representations of culture and different indicators of culture. And he talks about artifacts at the top, which are our cultural representations. And then he talks about espoused values. So the cultural values that we say we have and that we write down that we have. And then underneath all of this are those basic underlying assumptions. And they're what really make up culture on that deep level. 
So in terms of security, we have the artifacts at the top. We have our awareness materials. We have our security posters. We have our videos. We have our branding. And that's great as a representation of what our security culture either is or is aiming to be. Then at the sort of middle level, when we're starting to get a little bit deeper, we have the espoused values. So we have what's written down on our intranet pages, in our newsletters, in our security policy, you know, those values that we are pinning ourselves to and saying, this is, this is us, this is security. And that's a little bit deeper than the artifacts, um, which are the most shallow indicator of security culture. Underneath all of this, the really strong and deep and embedded indicators of security culture are those assumptions and the assumptions will feed into behaviors. So the assumptions might be things like security is not that important around here. I can write my passwords down on a post-it note because they're too difficult to remember and I'm not getting any help managing them. So I'm just going to stick that there because I see everyone else doing it. Um, or it might be you know, I get told off um, if I am clicking on links in phishing emails, I have to go through mandatory training again. So I don't want to get told off. Um, and I see that other people are kind of hiding this stuff. So you know what, I'm just going to keep it quiet. Um, when I've maybe clicked on a link that I'm not sure of, because there's that culture of fear. Or it might be there's been a big promotion on the importance of reporting fishes and people are getting um, congratulated for reporting a fish. People are being sort of championed for having done that. So actually the right behavior is for me to be reporting. So it's those underlying assumptions, the narratives that people tell themselves that feed into the behaviors that we then see. And I've mentioned a little bit about um, diversity and inclusion and the importance of us thinking that in, of that in terms of security. And I always really like to draw on this quote about why that matters. It's a quote from Leila Janna, um, who was a social entrepreneur, who says very succinctly, talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. And so we need to look at how we think about diversity and inclusion in terms of the security community and in terms of our awareness raising, behavioral change and cultural change activities. Because if we have a security culture that is lacking diversity and inclusion, then it's lacking fairness, it's lacking representation and it's lacking talent. So if we, for example, are building a champions program, we need to look at that champions program and think, are we generating inclusivity? Is this a diverse network? What can we do to be more inclusive to make this community as fair, as representative and as successful and talented as possible? I am pleased to see that actually I think there's started to be a shift for organizations and security teams to focus more on diversity and inclusion. So here I'm sharing some statistics from Club C. So we run research every year with a cohort of our members. So here we asked um, our chief information security officer members, you know, what percentage of you would rate the inclusivity of your diversity, of the diversity of your team? So do you think you've got an inclusive and a diverse team? And they had to rate it um, from one to five and five being the most inclusive. And we see that 40% said four or five. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a decent number, but it's certainly not the majority. And I don't think it's, it's good enough by any means. However, when we asked the CISOs to rate the inclusivity and the diversity of their hiring policies, because we know many of them have been working on that, we saw that actually almost 70% said they do feel like they have a really good um, hiring policy in terms of inclusivity and diversity. So I think that hints towards the fact that we are going to see more progress. And that's really important for us to make sure that we do. I have been really heartened to see conversations in Club CISO, particularly over the last year, that have focused on how can we be more diverse? How can we be more inclusive? What can we do to make sure that our hiring policy, that our staff retention, that our recruitment 
is encouraging people from different um, groups in society to come and join us. I was also heartened to see that the majority of responses when they were asked, what is the hot topic on your radar? So what are you thinking about in terms of security for the next year? And the overwhelming majority said security culture. Just shortly behind that was cyber resilience. And we asked these questions just after the UK went to lockdown. So CISOs are really thinking about security culture and that's a great opportunity for us in awareness, behavior and culture to be really tapping into the fact that our security leadership is wanting to work on this and wanting to work on this for the year ahead. How are they doing it? We gave them a number of options. And actually, if people have recommendations of options we should have included, um, of things you're doing in your organization to foster a better security culture, if it's not listed there, then I would absolutely love for you to come on Slack or wherever and tell me uh, what else we should be including. But I was really pleased to see that they're doing a lot of different things. Most popular, um, was building security champion programs. And after that, having a proactive, reported, no blame policy. I love working on security champion programs for organizations. We're very privileged at Sygenta to be working with different organizations on their champion programs. And I love it because you see such a scaling up of the activities around awareness, behavior, and culture. And I believe there is a presentation on that later on today. And um, so I'm not gonna say much more other than it can be so effective at establishing more momentum and at establishing more of a two-way communication between security and the rest of the organization. And I was also so pleased to see that many of the CISOs are trying to build a more proactive report, no blame policy and approach to security incidents. Because as we all know, if we blame people for security incidents, that doesn't mean we're gonna see less incidents. It just means we see less reporting of incidents. So I think we're in a really positive place there in terms of um, the way that security leadership is focusing more on inclusion and diversity, the way that they are focusing more on culture and the way that they are focusing more on engaging with people in a way that we know works. So moving away from blaming them to not blaming them and being more empowering. The more we can empower people to engage in security, the more successful we are. And I love the idea of building up our security communities more in our organizations and of building up the community we have between one another. And that's why I'm so delighted to have been able to speak with you all, because I love what the SAN Security Awareness community does in terms of building up one another, sharing resources, sharing ideas, and helping each other be more effective in our work. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. It's been a real privilege to speak with you all. You can find us and me on all the usual platforms, um, but I would love it if you would come and join me in the hallway on Slack and we can chat more about um, my presentation or anything that um, people are up to in terms of their security awareness, behavior and cultural change programs.